narcissism I find to be an absolutely fascinating topic. And the reason why I don't think it's dark is because I believe that when you understand what it is and what Mm, it isn't, mm, and mm. when you have tools, Mm -hmm, all of a mm -hmm. sudden there is a light at the Mm -hmm. end of the tunnel that you're walking down and you realize you're not crazy. You're around somebody who's making you believe you are. Correct. That's beautifully put. And I, I agree with you in a way what it is, is you're giving you know, back in the day, we would have said a roadmap. No, I'd like to think of it as GPS. I'm giving people a, I'm hoping to give people a guide to what they're dealing with and not in an accusatory, you're bad, I'm good way, but in more of a, this may not be good for me. And to not, the challenge in this space, the narcissism space, is so many people invest themselves and will, can I get this person to change? Can I be better? Can I do different to pull something different out of them? And it's to say, stop, that, that's not going to change, right? It's like trying to change the weather. There's nothing you can do to make Chicago warmer in February. It's going to be cold, bundle up, great city, but it's going to be cold. Okay, right? I want to I just uh, go, there was a wake up call right there. When you're done listening to this episode, and you understand what narcissism is, and you learn the signs to spot it. Takeaway number one is, you cannot change the weather in Chicago, Mm -mm, and you cannot change the behavior of a narcissist. So let's start at the beginning, because people are fascinated by the topic of narcissism. Mm -hmm. The word is now thrown around Mm -hmm. all the Mm -hmm. time. What is the definition of a yeah. narcissist? Okay, so let's get, a, I'm, I'm, I even want to go to step zero from step one here, is to say narcissism is not a diagnosis, okay? Wait, what? It's not, everyone's like, don't diagnose people. I'm like, okay, I, I roll up to someone, I said, if I called you stubborn, would you tell me I'm diagnosing you? They're like, no. If I told you you were agreeable, would you tell me I'm diagnosing you? No. Then why are you saying narcissism is a diagnosis when it's not? It is a personality style, just like agreeableness, just like introversion. All of those are personality styles. Nobody's getting themselves all the bee in their bonnet when we say those other things. Wait a minute. Yeah. I thought that this was Mm-mm. like a diagnosis. Mm-mm. See, already I'm learning stuff from you. So narcissistic personality disorder is a diagnosis right okay that is okay that's a very specific three words specific it's like it let me put it this way no one would get mad at you if you walked up and said gosh you're sad you seem a little depressed (gasps) don't diagnose me we'd be okay with you saying oh you're sad you you seem a little depressed right why depressed actually is a kind of a clinical term right depression it's actually called major depressive disorder is a diagnosis that's actually more on point but this word has got people so worked up don't diagnose me it's interesting it's a pattern that is rewarded by society and yet people don't want to be called it i'm like pick a lane folks (laughs) so it's so let's start here it is it is a personality style it is a maladaptive style it is an antagonistic style but it's a style no different than any other personality style okay Okay, so just so i make sure that i'm tracking and everybody's tracking Mm -hmm. so basically we've collapsed two things when we talk about narcissism Mm -hmm. in society there is narcissists and narcissism, which is a personality mm, style, style that is maladaptive mm-hmm. that we all might exhibit at some point. Nope. No. Oh, okay. No, 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 no. I got a personality. You got a personality. People listening and watching this, they've got a personality and that's their personality. I know. I'm, for example, Mel, I'm introverted. Okay. Everyone's like, no, you talk so much. Um, oh, heck no. There was a day the other day where I didn't speak to a single human being and I didn't leave my house. It was the best day of my <laughs> week. And people are, aren't you sad? And you're, we're going out. I'm like, have fun. Don't call me. Like, we're good. So I am a naturally introverted person. I am never going to be the life of the party. I am never going to want to go to a party. I am not a joiner. And after I spend time with a large group of people, I collapse into bed. Okay. Yep. That's my personality. Okay. I've been like that since all my life. All right. Okay. And that got shaped. So if that is my personality, some people aren't a little bit introverted. There's an extroverted person. If you've ever spent time with an extroverted person, they actually kind of lose their mind. I don't have plans. Where is everybody? I can't believe I need to be alone. I've worked with clients who are extroverted and they really are upset about that. And as an introverted therapist, I, for a minute I was like, what? Like that sounds like fantasy camp, like three days alone. 
sign me up, you know, right. but I have to, I have to be empathic to this is hard for them. Yep. They're exhausted by being alone. I have an incredibly extroverted child. And when she's alone for six hours, it, she actually starts feeling very sad. Mm. And so, and that's real. I can't say, don't be ridiculous. Use your time alone. Like, just like if somebody said, don't be ridiculous, Romney, you're at a party, you know, lighten up. It's the same thing. So that's why I'm saying you are what you are. I, I actually think a lot of people out there don't have narcissistic qualities. So let, this leads us to then what is this? Right. Right. Personality what style. Is this? So, it so is, there, but there's two things. Just so I'm tracking, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about narcissism as a personality style. Yep. And then narcissistic personality, personality disorder, disorder and I'm which gonna, is a diagnosis. It's a diagnosis, and you know Got what? It. I don't even think we should talk about it. Okay. Because the fact is, only one to maybe four percent of the population has this personality disorder. Okay. The vast majority of cases are never diagnosed, and it is a I actually think they should get rid of the diagnosis. I think it serves wow. no function whatsoever. I really don't. It's the only diagnosis in the world where having it means you do more harm to other people than to yourself. Most disorders are based on the distress that the person themselves are facing. A person with major depressive disorder is really struggling. A person with generalized anxiety disorder is experiencing distress. Even other personality disorders like borderline personality disorder, these are people who are having a lot of distress. Narcissistic personality disorder, as long as life's going the way they want it to, they are happy as can be and until something goes wrong then they make a mess scream at everyone and then when it goes back to the way they are they tend to make more money they're much more successful they tend to have more success in dating so i'm that this is a tough diagnosis to give out now let's break down what narcissism is okay, okay great so um, so if i and i just want to make sure because this is such an interesting topic and Obviously, there's lots of content mm -hmm. out there all over mm -hmm. the place, but you are, in my opinion, the world's leading expert on this. Mm -hmm. And so what you're basically saying is, if we just understand what a narcissistic personality is, mm -hmm. that's enough. Yeah. Because then you can spot the signs, yep. then you can learn to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. And if I'm going to extrapolate mm -hmm. what you're saying you're basically saying the one to 4% of people that ever get that diagnosis mm -hmm. anyway mm -hmm. already have the personality already. type. So it doesn't matter. It's just blown out, out of proportion and they're finally now in therapy. And don't most nar narcissists don't, don't know go nurses. to therapy. That's the thing. That's what I'm saying. So there's a lot of people out there who may have this quote unquote diagnosis. They're never going to get diagnosed because they're never across the table from a licensed mental health professional who's actually the only person qualified to issue such di said diagnosis. And I'm going to be honest with you. Even the majority of people who have the disorder, it's never documented anywhere because the insurance company ain't going to pay for therapy for it because you can't do anything about it. So you see okay, what I'm hold saying? On, hold on. So that was also just, you, you just said it again. You cannot change yeah. the weather in Chicago. Nope. And you cannot do anything to change somebody with a narcissistic personality? Yeah, and let's push this a little bit further, okay? So this is, I'm going to be sort of a provocateur here. Personality is tough. I, I, there's, there's different schools of thought on how much personality can change, all right? There's a little wiggle room. And I think the more, a, the greater a person's flexibility, psychological and personality, the healthier the person is. It's almost like your body. The more flexible you are, likely yep. the more you work it out, the less likely you're going to develop osteoporosis and break bones and all that. Flexibility is everything. But it, I would say it matters more psychologically than it even means physically, right? That's why people stretch before a workout. Oh, that's interesting. Because what I'm thinking about right now is there's a, there's a pretty uh, well- there's a pretty famous TED talk, but I think it's Dr. Schwartz talking about personality mm. and what he basically says. And now I'm realizing it's the flexibility you're talking about. Mm -hmm. He, like you said, I'm a professor and I am very introverted, mm -hmm. but when it matters yes. to me, I can be flexible. I can stand in front of yep. that, you know, that, that classroom and yep. I can profess. But the second that lecture is over, I collapse. I'm done. That's it. That's so, it. So the flexibility you're talking about is that an extrovert like me can shut up and be alone mm -hmm. when it matters. Mm -hmm. An introvert like you can step in front of the mic, invite people into your yep. home when it yep. matters. Yep. But that flexibility is very limited. It's tied to when it's important to you, but then you go back to your baseline. Is that what you're saying? Always. And so, in fact, there is a theory, and I hope I credit it to this right person. I think it's Campbell is the one who writes about this, the idea of the rubber band theory of personality. And the idea of the rubber band is that you, we all have our personality. Rubber bands just sit in there and it's state. That's who we are. 
but we can stretch it. Okay. We could stretch it a bit, but when back to baseline or even at times of stress, we go to our baseline personality, right? The challenge is, is that that person with a narcissistic personality not only has trouble stretching, it's not even the stretching as much as the changing. You see, here's the challenge with the narcissistic personality, which I still haven't described and I'm aware of it. <laughs> Sorry. But the, uh, the challenge with the narcissistic personality is, is that it's, it's a very egocentric, self-serving style, right? It's designed to get them what they need. It's, it's what, they, what helps them feel safe, what helps them feel happy with very little regard for anyone else. Other personality styles, agreeableness. In fact, agreeableness is considered the counterweight to narcissism. So narcissism is actually what's called, it's, it's a real personality style is disagreeableness or antagonism, right? So if narcissism is disagreeableness, agreeableness is the other side of that. Agreeable people are, I love agreeable people. They're the best. Like I just would like a, like a little commune full of them. We're never going to take over the world we and we're one? not going to make a lot of money. But let me tell you, so fun. Empathic, warm, flexible, um, make accommodation for other people, follow the rules, highly ethical. That's agreeableness. Opposite of narcissism, right? So what is narcissism. So narcissism is a person who has a lack of empathy and I'm going to talk about or performative empathy, which I'm going to get to in a minute. Okay. So, but they have inconsistent or low empathy. They're very entitled. They're arrogant. They're egocentric. They're chronically validation and admiration seeking. They need to be in control all the time. They are poorly emotionally regulated, prone to show strong shows of rage if they're frustrated or disappointed or aren't getting in their way. They're very easily provoked and very thin-skinned. If anyone gives them feedback or criticism, like, Rah! they just rage very quickly. They can't regulate themselves at those times. Um, they're very pretentious. They tend to be very superficial. Um, I mean, the list goes, it's, it's that kind of stuff. Now, the core of narcissism is a deep insecurity. And that's the piece we forget. These are not people actually who, at their most primal unconscious level, believe their hype. They are, the, all of this stuff is to create a, almost a suit of armor around that unprocessed insecurity. The narcissistic person is always fighting a battle against shame. And the shame is that at an unconscious level, people are going to see they ain't all that. So if anything even pokes them, that like even someone makes a joke at their expense, they lash out to maintain dominance. Because that's that you also want to know what motivates the narcissistic person. Power, dominance, control, and frankly, safety, because all those things keep them safe. If they're in control, if they're the boss, if they have all the money, then they feel okay, all the power, whatever, the fame, whatever it looks like, then they're okay. That's narcissism. What's tricky about narcissism is there's different, I've, I forgot to also say they're very grandiose. So they live in a fantasy world. I'm going to have the perfect love story. Look at my perfect life. You can see how social media took this grandiosity and blew it up into something that I've been studying narcissism since before there was social media. And I was like, what the holy hell just what happened? Have you seen? I mean, what happened was narcissism's always been around as long as there were human beings. I mean, I'm guessing like Attila the Hun was probably a narcissist. Napoleon might've been a narcissist. I think if you go all the way back in the history books, in fact, when I helped my daughter with all of her ancient and, you know, even modern European history, I'm like, narcissist, narcissist, narcissist. And I said, you see how much they shaped history to this day. So I think that what it's always been there. Yeah. Okay. The difference was back in the day, if you needed validation, okay, you and I are both old enough to know about rotary dial phones and no <laughs> answering machines and no social media. Okay. So there was a time if you needed validation, you actually had to clean up and leave the house true right like yes. you actually had to get up and go you couldn't become famous right even if you wrote a letter to the editor of the newspaper on some kind of rant the editor was going to get a hundred of these or they'd get a hundred of these and pick one so there was no public place to do this so where narcissists really did their 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 dirty work was they would harm the people around them very dominant uh, probably cruel to spouses cruel to children i think if you look at family lines of this intergenerationally they'll say like yeah really brutal father really brutal grandfather really brutal great grandfather and it often links to things like hierarchies patriarchies like things that are all very very hierarchical 
hierarchical. One person gets the final say, mm. not because they're a good person, right. but just because. So these systems have always been there. And so what happened though is one day, I remember it so well. I, I remember the house I was living in. Somebody said to me, have you seen this thing called Facebook? I'm like, Facebook. And I, rem I remember what a Facebook was. A right. Facebook was that group college. of pictures yep. that you'd get in your first year of college. Like I, That's what it was called where I yep. went to college. We had one right? at Dartmouth too. Yep. So there's a Facebook. And I'm like, what is, is it a college thing? And they're like, no, you need to go check this out. They said, create an account. So I did. And I was like, oh, this is what happened to all those people I went to high school with. Okay. But at the moment, I thought, oh, God, you just write stuff and people like it. What went through my head in that moment? I remember my kids were really small at the time. And I, it's, the moment sticks in my mind. I thought, this is going to be a disaster. You know, it must have been like being like a, like a pulmonologist or a cardiologist when cigarettes were out. You're like, what is happening? And so at that moment, I thought the game's about to change. I had no idea what was going to come with the Instagram and the influencing and all. I had no idea what was coming there. But I thought, wow, no, nobody needs to leave the house. They can put forth a false version of themselves, the grandiose version, the fantasy version, and sit at home and let the validation come in. My concern was that this was going to make their narcissistic symptomatology worse overall. And I think that has been borne out. Wow. So, so can I ask you a question? Because this is one of the things that really changed my life. When you taught me that narcissists are not born, they're made. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is it? Can you explain that to everybody? Because this is this is a game changer yeah. to understand this. So nobody's born this way. Okay. I mean, so I guess even in a family structure where you have a grandfather, a father, nope. like these dominant or mother person, it you are not born a narcissist. Everyone listening to this, it will say there are four kids in our family, and I have a brother who's narcissistic, and the rest of us are really cool and nice and kind to each other. So I think of how many people out there who have siblings, and like I'm, uh, my, my sister's really kind, and my other sister's really, really narcissistic. So it's if that was the case, it should appear in all siblings, or at least at least fifty percent of them. So it's how not does that. it get made? It's it's made. So here's the most likely explanation is that there may very well be, and this has not been isolated yet, but there may very well be a biological vulnerability to it. And that would be probably delivered through something called a child's baby's temperament. Temperament is the genetic part of our personality. Anyone who spent time around a baby will know some kids soothe really easily. Some kids are just, they're easy. They're easy, smiley, friendly babies. They're really sweet kids, right? Right. And as they grow up, they stay sweet and the teachers like them and they have friends and they're just sweet, sweet, sweet. Then there are those kids who will not stop crying and they're demanding. And as they grow up, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And they're always doing things for attention and they're disruptive and they won't sit still. And, and as they enter preschool and school, the teachers always Shh, sit down, stop that. So they're already starting to get kind of bad vibes from their constant attention seeking behavior. It's probably an interaction effect. The kid may not be getting enough attention or attachment needs met. So you have this biological temp vulnerability. Yep. In the hands of a skilled, attached, warm, present, loving, consistent parent, that might be manageable. And that sort of ah, energy might get turned into athletic interest or creative interest, and that child won't feel pathologized for their style but I hate to say it probably for the majority of kids with that style it's a lot of stop that sit down can't you be more like your sister you're going in the corner you're you're making a mess you're going to the principal so that kid is getting invalidated every time they turn around that invalidation plus the temperament plus the possibility that they don't have a, a, a an environment where there's a possibility for secure attachment plus the possibility of trauma, chaos, and neglect. That's one pathway to develop a narcissist. So, so if I can just make sure I'm understanding, mm -hmm. what you're basically saying is, even regardless of temperament, if mm -hmm. you're not getting your emotional mm -hmm. needs mm -hmm. met, if you mm -hmm. do not feel mm -hmm. safe and secure in your mm -hmm. house, if you have a parent mm -hmm. that abandons you, a parent that's abusive, you. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, somebody mm -hmm. with mental illness and addiction, somebody who's unpredictable, that you as a child don't feel safe or you don't feel seen, all those mm -hmm. emotional needs, and that's what leads to narcissism? But not always. In fact, I wouldn't say the vast majority of the time. Many, 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 many people grew up in situations like that of trauma, of neglect, of abuse, of chaos. 
And they do not go on to become narcissistic. They typically go on to become rather anxious adults with poor self-appraisal um, who don't know their value and worth, a whole nother different burden to carry. But the narcissist... Are you talking about me? Uh, no, no, I was actually <laughs> talking about myself, my dear. So yeah, that's all me. You know, so it's a... Um, but at the end of it, what we see is that it's still... The problem is, is that these paths aren't linear. I always say narcissism is a story. We, the development of narcissism is a story we can tell backwards, but never forwards. Oh. So if I, I'm thinking I have some clients who have been through horrific early childhood trauma, horrific um, physical abuse, sexual abuse, violence. They grew up in chaos to tell you that these are some of the most empathic, loving human beings I've ever met would be actually missing the mark. They're, they're just solid people. If anything, they don't understand their value. Like their, their harm is very internalized. It's like, I'm not good enough. I'm not doing enough, but there's so much goodness, so much empathy. They've gone on to become amazing parents, all of that. Right. So that it's that, that early chaos does not damn someone by a long shot, but it does set up these, uh, what are called adverse childhood experiences. It, definitely if we view it definitely if we view this from a probability standpoint there's more negative outcomes that could come either internalized disliking oneself or externalized and that's more of what narcissism could potentially look like now there's a secondary path to narcissism okay and that secondary path is actually one we probably should be monitoring in modern times quite a bit which is the overindulged child the child who gets whatever they want they, they, money is spent on them lavishly you're so great you're so smart there was a study done out of amsterdam now It'll be interesting to see what happens when these kids turn into adults. He was studying children. But what he found, this guy, I think his name is Eddie Brummelmans at the University of Amsterdam. And what he found was that children who were told they're more special than other children, those were the kids that were already showing entitlement and other sort of soft signs of narcissism. So it's not that you're telling your child they're special. It's that you're more special than somebody else. Oh, that was sort of that. That was the sort of the penny drop moment, which is very much what you could imagine a more narcissistic parent doing. My child is more special than the other children. My child deserves special treatment. My child should play the whole game. My child should get this. My child should get that. But you're looking at kids where they're not taught the most. Im- There's two critical things three critical things i'd say every child needs okay so there's three critical three. things secure every child attachment needs. secure attachment so explain it secure attachment secure attachment happens when a child has at least one primary caregiver that is consistently available that the child feels that they can call that caregiver when they need them that 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 secure attachment develops over the early years. I'm more talking birth to like two or three. This is something where you got to get, you got to lock this in early, Kay. right? And that securely attached child in those early experiments done by John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth, sort of seminal work in the field. What they found was that the child who was securely attached when mom would leave them in a strange situation, that would be preschool or babysitter or something like that, the child would whimper a little, like, where are you going? But then they would actually calm down very quickly with the mm. soothing of a caregiver. And then when the parent came back to pick them up, the child would be thrilled to see them. In children who are more anxiously or avoidantly or insecurely attached, there would be almost difficult to soothe kind of when at the point the parent came back and more importantly i mean when the parent left so they'd be difficult to soothe when the parent left and when the parent came back the child would actually either go into absolutely like another meltdown almost like how could you leave me or they turn their head away from the parent you see whereas that securely attached child would actually be happy to see the parent when they return see okay so now that secure attachment is number one and that's created by consistency and availability in that early environment you need one parent doing that and it one primary caregiver to be honest it's it's, uh, anyone whoever that child identifies as such number two is that children need to they they need to learn how to soothe themselves and they learn need to learn how to be disappointed Okay. And we're not letting them do that. Like sometimes you fail. Sometimes you don't get the teacher you want. Sometimes they run out of chocolate ice cream by the time you get up. And you know what? You sometimes you lose at shoots and ladders. I remember like saying, I'm going to win this game. And you know, people like, don't let them win. I'm not going to let them win. So I'm, I'm getting up to the top of the l- shoots and ladders and I'm going to win. And I'm saying, wow, that felt good. And when my daughter said, that's not fair. I said, oh, ho, ho, ho. I won this game. Let's be present with me winning. You want to play again? 
sure we can do that again but you need to learn to be present that not every outcome is the way you're going to want it to be Mm -hmm. that's number two number three is empathy you've got to foster empathy in children and foster compassion that can be through books they read stories they experience sure but above all else in the home how do they learn that it's modeled for them they see parents empathizing or caregivers empathizing with each other they see extended family empathizing with each other they see empathy in the classroom they see empathy in the world you can and you can imagine a child who sees none of that or the parent is acting in a very entitled manner like oh let's just go to the head of the line we're more important than these people or oh gosh you know we're not sitting in that line all these things parents do that they think are innocuous in an airport at a soccer game at a theme park your kid's learning, and their their brain is just an explosion of neurons and dead rights, and that's getting filed away under, we're special. You know, the reason why this is so interesting to me is because I think one of the challenges when you have either, either a narcissistic parent mm-hmm. or sibling mm-hmm. or boss mm-hmm. or somebody that you're in a relationship mm-hmm. with is that you think that somehow everything is your fault. Yes. And when I learn from you that narcissists are made in childhood, Mm -hmm. it just opened up this door for me to go, oh, wow. So they didn't like choose to be this way. They're not consciously doing Mm -hmm. this. It's what it is. It's, it's a, it's a regulation issue, right? So it's the sense that a narcissistic person never quite feels safe in the world right? Because they never feel safe. They're always on the offense and the defense simultaneously, right? I'm going to win. I'm going to dominate me, me, me. And are you looking at me? You're you're looking at me and and then rage, rage, rage. So that constant offense defense that they play is a, makes them very antagonistic unless things are going exactly the way they want. And where narcissistic people are tricky is that if they feel safe, I got to tell you, it might be one of the most engaging, entrancing, exhilarating, charismatic, charming experiences you've ever had. They've hung the moon. They've hung the sun only for you. It is, I mean, it's dopamine. Okay. It's literally a Jekyll and Hyde experience. It is. But then at a time they don't feel safe or they're bored it's over and people will spend their lives trying to get back to that hung the sun hung the moon kind of a moment and they said they really don't have any more use for you anymore then that's it you ain't gonna feel that again well let's talk about what are the five warning signs that someone's a narcissist so i would say number one would be that they're very reactive if they experience any form of feedback or criticism so if you say anything even even like a really thoughtful critique like you know i would consider rewriting this paragraph throw the paper in your face really really oh so you're james joyce you write it you know that kind of thing so very reactive very quick okay number two oppositionality if you tell them to do something, they, they'll go out of their way. They don't like being told what to do. So you might ask them, could you wear a mask? That was a big one during the pandemic. Could you oh, wear a mask? Yeah. How dare you tell me to do this? Um, could you not park there? That's reserved parking for the people who are coming to get, uh, I don't know, coming to for whatever reason. How can these parks are, these spots aren't, you, I'm parking right here. They, if you tell them to do something, it is as though they feel they're being dominated and controlled. They ain't having that. That's another thing is you see oppositionality. They are, their empathy is very superficial. Some people say, no, 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 they had empathy. I'm like, talk to me about that empathy. And what you'll see is that it is very performative. It's very superficial. Like, So can you give us an example? An example might be, um, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, your brother's sick. Oh, wow. That's got to be really, really hard. Are you okay? Are you okay? That sounds nice. Okay. Then <laughs> yeah. very quickly, it'll be like, you're, and now you want to talk about it. Like, you'll st- I'm the other person now. Yeah, I know he's been sick, but it's brought up all this other stuff for me. You know, like I'm really feeling like lost and I'm realizing how much my brother is, how I, and then the narcissist is going to be doing a lot of like this. They don't want to hear it. So they'll, they'll come in with, they'll, they'll say, I always say this narcissistic folks are great at thank you cards and thank you gifts. 
but they're really bad at a true gratitude. Mm. So they will be seemingly empathic, but as soon as you go in a little deeper, like you're actually really talking about how your brother's illness affected mm-hmm. you, now you'll see they'll tune out like, woo, too much emotion coming their way, too much need. So it's very quick silver, th- what I call thank you card empathy. Like mm-hmm. it'll seem so on point, but they're not really present with you. They'll cry at a movie, but when that same exact thing happens in their life, there's n- they're, they're actually treating the other person badly and they don't even connect it to you. Like you were just crying when those that man beat someone in the in the story and then yet you were threatening some like how do you not see and they don't see it they wow. do not see it so there is a performative quality to the empathy and there's also a transactional quality to their empathy they'll be really warm to you when they need something but when they get it they'll actually click out and that's a really bad feeling because you recognize oh they were just nice to me to get that thing so i'd say it's this inconsistent wow. performative sort of pseudo superficial empathy that's another thing um The fourth, I would say, is egocentricity. It's really hard for them to not hijack a conversation, interrupt people, and constantly make it about themselves. So even when somebody might say, I went abroad for my very first trip, and it was amazing, and I went on an airplane, and I did this, and I did that, I got my first passport, like really sweet. It's so beautiful to hear people. And you just sort of drink it all in. The narcissistic person, give them like three minutes, and they're like, what airline did you take? Yeah, and no, I, I take that airline. It's not that great. Oh, what hotel do you stay in? Like, oh, the hotel I'd recommend in Rome is this. It's, oh, oh, well, I went there. Oh, I went to that restaurant, and it just becomes, now it's their travelogue, and they're yammering on. They just love to hold court, and my ma 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 It's always, the conversation always steers back to them. They cannot simply be present with somebody else telling a story, or will interrupt, or will sort of be contemptuous and be like, like that there'll be a lot i'll do that for the camera like like a lot of like oh my gosh we're listening to this sort of like summer vacation story great what a good use of my time if anyone's ever watched succession i'd say the best contemptuous narcissist performance i've ever seen in my life is roman played by kieran culkin it it, he's never have i seen that narcissistic contempt so consistently played by a character that if anyone if you want to know what that looks like watch succession is that the same thing as triangulation no so triangulation is creating chaos in environments so is that a fifth sign to look for a triangulation i would say that it's hard to look for triangulation you have to look for the soft signs of triangulation which be gossip talking badly about other people, trying to get the goods on other people. So they're always trying to like sort of talk talk to me about this person, talk to me about that person. And then you'll come to find out they're doing the same thing about you to someone else. Yeah. Wow. And what is the fifth sign if it's not that sort of soft triangulation thing? I would say then it is. It's it's constantly having to put other people down to lift them up. You know, oh, yeah, he, he thinks he got the right Tesla. Pfft. Yeah, that's actually that's just sort of the baseline model or like ugh, nobody stays on that side of that island. It's very it's it's putting other people down and it is contempt. I would I would wrap up contempt in that narcissistic people are notoriously contemptuous. It often comes out as snobbery, but it can even come out uh, even like like, oh, God, dude, like nobody's doing that and like make fun of someone. And it can really it can hurt the other person. And then what the narcissistic person will often do is they will then turn around and say, oh, I was just making a joke. So now if you react to it, it's a joke. But if you say something to them and you say it's just a joke, they'll still rage at you. And I'll throw in a sixth sign, or it could be 5A, is um, gaslighting. They're constantly doubting reality. Um, I never said that. I never did that. Um, I didn't put that there. Um, That never happened. And then when you try to push back on that, <clears throat> when you try to push back on that, they'll say, oh my God, you're so sensitive. Or have you seen a shrink? Because people don't usually react the way you are. So they leave you feeling as though you're impaired. So I'd say that gaslighting is, like I said, 5A, because I gave you contempt as 5. Well, so. okay. So I don't know if anybody else listening is having the experience I'm having right now, where I, I, I have a pit in my stomach hmm. because I have at least one person, very prominent person that I have in my mind in my life. And I'm like, check, check, Mm -hmm. check, check, check. Somebody's talking at the table. They're rolling their eyes Mm -hmm. at other people. Somebody leaves the room. They just immediately Mm -hmm. trash them as they leave. What I want to know is we'll get into 
what to do. But now that you're really kind of pulling apart the signs Mm -hmm. and we've learned that there are sort of two tracks in childhood where this behavior and this personality type is made. Mm -hmm. What is the impact if you have a parent Mm -hmm. that is like this? Like as an, like if you've been raised by somebody that exhibits all five of these, or you're like, Oh my God, I think my mom or my dad was a freaking narcissist. Like check, check, check. How does that impact you now that you're an adult? So it, it's not good. That's oh, the best God. answer I can give you. It is not good. So let's remember two things. First of all, I'm going to add a 5B to that list. Look for entitlement. Like that idea of they won't wait in line. They're, they're special. They expect special treatment and they get really angry if they're not given special treatment. That's another sign to look for. But Check. let's remember this about narcissism. It's on a continuum. Not all narcissists are the same. So a person who is dealing with more of what we call a milder, lighter narcissistic person is having a very different experience than somebody who's dealing with a rather severe narcissistic person. And I think that what that has sort of muddied the waters in this conversation, because if a person dealing with a milder narcissist, here's the story of somebody who's dealing with a really severe narcissist they're saying, well, maybe I'm not dealing with a narcissist because I'm not living in terror. You know, I'm not isolated from all my friends. I still think that person dealing with a lighter narcissist is still feeling unseen, unheard, self-blaming and all of that. It's just at a different level. The reason I bring this up is with the parents, right? I do think that any narcissism in a parent is never good for a child. Um, But at the more severe levels, it's absolutely devastating. What it does is it hijacks a child's sense of self, identity, autonomy. They, They don't believe in themselves. They believe that their needs are not, in fact, they've been shamed for their needs their entire life. How, what, you want something from me? You know, like that's what the parent attitude is. Maybe not that explicitly, but people who grow up with narcissistic parents, the vast majority become rather anxious adults who are not aware of their own self-worth, who have very inaccurate um, self-appraisal, usually in the wrong direction. They do they devalue themselves entirely. They don't trust themselves. They downsell themselves. They don't aspire to things that they actually could do because in some ways they've so internalized the way they were shamed by that parent. But above all else, they sort of lose their entire sense of self because their parent never let them develop it. Because in essence, the parent really experience the child as an extension of themselves. When the what chi- does that mean? When, so, when the child's the extension of the parent? So it means that the child should have no needs outside of that parent. So if the child goes along, everyone gets along. If they're, mommy, mommy, you're so pretty and we'll do anything you want and they eat the way the parent wants and they do the sport the parent wants and they excel at what the parent wants and they they just become literally the parent and have no identity or need outside of that. Everything's going to be just fine, but that's not how kids work. The whole point of being a child is to individuate and become autonomous. And once that happens, the parent is not interested in that and they don't like it. So the child will always feel that they're almost in psychological servitude to that parent. They're not allowed to have a reality outside of the parent. Wow. Let's talk a little bit about this sort of whiplash because you know, when you're dealing with a narcissistic parent or spouse or boss, it feels like I keep reading these comments from our audience Mm -hmm. about like, on one hand, you're like, okay, there's the tantrum behavior, but you still feel responsible for them. You still feel guilty when you're mad at them. You still Mm -hmm. want to please them. Correct. Why? Because that, that, There's a guy named Daniel Shaw who writes about this brilliantly, and I want to credit him because I'm going to use his language. He he talks about, and it's going to use a technical term, and I'm going to bring it down to what all of us, how we'd make sense of it. He calls having a narcissistic parent, he calls it a loss of intersubjectivity. That's a real fancy way of saying, it's my reality, it's my way, you or you're almost like a non-entity here. You, everyone exists to serve me. I don't want you to have needs. I don't want you to be something separate. And a healthy parent, the child will be sad and the parent will sort of, even if the child, parent's in a good mood, the child will stop and be with their sad child and, and listen to them and empathize. Whereas a narcissistic parent will say, um, this is my birthday. What is happening here? Like, wait, you're not, get this kid away from me. Like, well, how dare he cry on my birthday? It's that kind of thing right? So you, the child is not allowed to have any sort of 
experience outside of that of the parents and then the ch- and the parent really expresses the resentment at the child having needs thus the child internalizes a sense of shame and even guilt over having needs so when they go into adulthood that shame and guilt persists because that 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 relationship a lot of therapists don't address it that explicitly it's not an easy cycle to end because remember unlike an adult narcissistic relationship the child needs the parent the child needs the parent for safety, for shelter, for food. It's not like you can divorce a parent and say, I'm going to start dating again and see if I can find someone better. That is not how this works. The child knows the parent's the only game in town. And identity is very much shaped by that attachment relationship, by that caregiving parental relationship. So what you're learning is that you're a pain in the neck, don't need so much, you're not good enough, because if you were good enough, that parent would be regulated, that parent would be happy, so you're doing something wrong. And the narcissistic parent explicitly and implicitly communicates that to them. I wish you'd never been born, you're so much trouble. I would have had such an amazing career if it weren't for you. Child shouldn't be hearing that. They'll shame a child's weight like, oh, Goodness, so somebody's eating too much, it's because you're, you're a bad reflection on the parent if you don't look the way the parent wants. If you're not doing what the parent wants. Oh, my kid, uh, he wants to play a violin. He won't even play sports. All of those things are the child is supposed to be a functionary for the parent. And so as that person goes into adulthood, I would actually say it's almost a three-part whiplash. There is the sense of you know what the tantrum is. You see it coming. Mm-hmm. You then have the experience of is this my fault? I need to calm them down. I feel bad. And then you have the third experience that you may still have some good moments with that parent. That parent may be really smart, really interesting, really fun. I mean, in fact, a lot of people say, as I got older, there were parts of my parent I enjoyed because I'd noticed there was something fun, but I still felt the shaming and the blaming. And it's very interesting for a lot of narcissistic parents They like babies because babies are sort of like an accessory, like a bag. You can kind of take them around, like, you know, and show them around town. Once they stop being baggable and carryable, not so interested anymore, not so cute on social media, then there's this huge long period where that child needs more than it can give back. Then the child gets into late adolescent and early adulthood. The parent's interested again. They can go out to dinner with them. They can go to a bar with them. They can go on an interesting vacation with them. They can bring them into the family business. And so now they're interested in their kid. And for some kids who desperately wanted that love, they go all in on that. They're like, I'm going to play tennis with my dad or I'm going to, I'm going to help my mom in her business because now, now, now I'm going to get, I'm going to get that love, the love you wanted when you were four and you couldn't quite work in the family business. So now that, now, now that trauma, and that's where we get to this idea of the trauma bond. Okay. Let's talk about this because I, 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 I know that what's happening as you're listening to this is you're probably going ding, 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 ding. And we're focusing on parents right now, but we are going to get into romantic relationships. But I think it's an important distinction that with the parent child relationship, Mm -hmm. you are there, like you don't have an option. And so what do you do now? If you're sitting there listening to this and you're going, Oh my God, that's me. And I do keep jumping back into the fire. Mm -hmm. It's like this, are they super hostile? Or, you know, are they loving me? Did I get it right and now I'm getting affection? Or um, are they trying to annihilate me because they're not getting what they need from me and I'm not behaving? So right. as, an, as an adult now, if you're going, this is me, what do you do? So a couple things, all right? Number one, I am not gonna sugarcoat this and say there's like three easy steps to pushing back from a narcissistic parent. This ain't TikTok, folks. Like this is hard work. Okay, there is no three step, five step, 10 step, or even 172 step plan here. Okay, it is. I'm gonna take a deep breath because <laughs> I, I need every one of you to hear this is not TikTok. Okay, you no. need to wake up and realize that first of all, you're not changing the weather in Chicago Mm-mm. and you're not gonna change the personality type if your parent is a narcissist or you are in love with one. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. it's okay. So, number one, is the acknowledgement, and this is the hardest part of all, although you're this person's child, narcissistic people view all the people around them as objects, like my coffee maker or my tea maker. This morning I made a cup of tea. 
I don't think about my tea maker unless I want a cup of tea. When I want a cup of tea, me and my tea maker interact. The rest of the day, don't think about it once. At all? At all. Why would I? I don't need a cup of tea, right? And that's how a narcissistic person result thinks about other people. Do I need something really? from you? Yeah. Do I need something from you? Oh, yeah, I do need something from you. Now you're my central focus. I'm thinking about you, only you. But... Just like if that tea maker waddled over to me and said, hey, could you listen to me? I'd be like, what? You're a tea maker. Like, go away. This is not Beauty and the Beast. Appliances do not talk. Get the hell away from me. You are a tea maker. Learn your place. So for a narcissistic person, we all serve a function for them. Whether it's your their lover, whether you're their accountant, whether you're their cleaner. That's why narcissistic people always have like a team around them. It's always about the team. I'm like, of course you have a team around you because everyone serves a function for you. I'm trying to pick my mouth up off the floor because this is a revolutionary idea for me that a narcissistic person isn't ever thinking about you unless they need something exactly. for you. Exactly. And yet, if you have ever been in a serious relationship with a narcissist mm -hmm. or you were raised by one, you think about them all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All the time. All that you're ruminating. them. They're not thinking about you unless they need something from you or you're a blockade to something they need. Right. Like you're not signing the deal or you're because you're sick. They can't go to something. Now they're thinking about you because they're mad at you. Right. But it's it's so it's going okay, back I'm to your I'm parents. Sorry. I'm like. Going back to that parenting issue. So as you get into adulthood, you are an object to them. So like, what can I do? What can I do? You, you're never going to be able to read their mind and give them everything they want. There is not there. You will never be able to. None of us are mind readers. You're never going to be able to fully anticipate. And what's so sad is people who are all in with narcissistic parents or even narcissistic partners will. Will literally try to devote their lives to anticipating the narcissistic person's every need so they can finally, finally win them over, that they could do it just right. So that's not possible because none of us are mind readers. Remember that? So what do you do? You give up. You, you have, you, at that point, you're like, okay, I, I can only be the best person I can be. Live in a way that's in line with your own values, right? Now, this is why I'm saying that this is not an easy TikTok strategy because even as you do that, even when the day comes, you realize, my parents never going to end, but my parent is never going to change. None of this is my fault. It's really just my genetic bad luck that this is the parent I pulled. Yeah. Um, again, I am not responsible for any of this. I need to stop taking my bucket to an empty well. They are never going to notice me. They are never going to have empathy for me. I cannot live my life as a sacrifice to them and forever keep trying to please them and not living my own true authentic path. All of those things are important. Here's the part that I'm saying is never, this is just the work is, and then when you tell your parent, no, I'm not coming to dinner this Sunday. I'm not, I didn't feel good last month. I'm taking a pass. Really? You're not coming? I was making that special thing and I really miss you and I'm thinking of you and, and, you know, I'm getting older. 90% 90 90 of people are going to break under that one and they're going to show up and guess what's going to happen at that dinner again. The criticism, the humiliation, the devaluation, the invalidation, right? So I say to people, you got two options here. Either be with the, the guilt of saying no or go to the dinner with realistic expectations that when you, and almost make it a game, like a personal bingo. You know, it's not quite a drinking game because if you took a shot every time they invalidated <laughs> you, you'd be loaded before the main course came. But if you, I, I literally have done this where I'm like, okay, I'm going to collect points at this dinner for every five invalidations. I'm going to go like, I'm going to get a scoop of ice cream or I, and then like, and then it's like a little thing that pays out during the week. Like Tuesday, I'm going to get ice cream. And on Thursday, I might get a massage. Like 15 invalidations is usually a massage for me. And so I'm like, I'm objective. Yeah. Too. And I'm like, I'm gone. And I'm like, do it again, do it again, do it again. We're 13. I really want the massage. So, so, so let me ask you this question. So should you ever, confront a narcissist like somebody's going to come mm -hmm. listen to this podcast and be like all right that's it i'm calling dad nope nope i can't if we if we only said one thing in this entire podcast episode is never ever call out a narcissist we, we would be giving the single most brilliant piece of advice why do you never call out a narcissist uh, i should i'm going to temper that with it depends on what you want if you're doing this because you want to say, it's like a gotcha moment. Ha ha, I see you. Okay. 
and they're going to rage at you and they're going to scream at you and there might be a smear campaign now and they may be telling everybody out there that not only are you an ungrateful kid but you are the narcissist and you're the one who's harmful and everybody needs to keep their distance from you and, and uh, I mean they will really do such a number on you that and they're not going to change so if all it is for you to say I see you I think the better way to do to play that is you see them now change your behavior stop being supply for them stop engaging with them stop taking the bait so are you saying if you call home and the first thing out of somebody's mouth is haven't heard from you in a long time you should not say you know the phone works both ways no way no if you know this person's narcissistic absolutely not so they say haven't heard from you in a long time and you'd say no you haven't oh and well and then where are they going to go with that because what you've done is you've taken away the volley they're playing tennis you need to play solitaire can you give us some other role plays um so put put another conversation starter out there for me um uh why don't you come to thanksgiving uh, and you and the and the assumption in this one is why don't you come to Thanksgiving? Is this person's committed s fully to not yeah, going they, this year? Every they, you got to come to me. Okay, so you go. This is where, and I'm going to step back before I role play that. I'm going to introduce the concept of true north. Okay, the true, true, north. true north. Okay, true north is a big healing, what we call healing technique for folks, or at least it's a more of a management technique than healing, I should say. True north is that you need to figure out what in your life is worth fighting for. So maybe you're not going to Thanksgiving this year, not only because you don't want to see them, but it's your, your, your kid is playing football that day, all right? Yeah. And you do not want to miss that football game. Or you, have, you do actually have a big deadline at work the Monday after Thanksgiving and you want to get it done. Or you said, tack with it, this is the year we're actually going to go to, you're going to go camping or we're going to go to Hawaii for Thanksgiving, okay? Yep. You're, because that's what my family has always wanted to do, my, you know, you, whatever, your friends. You're, you've decided to take a trip with your friends. Your true north is what is healthy for you, okay? So you've got to be clear on that. It sounds like it's a balance between how much guilt can you tolerate, right? Kind of. It is and it isn't because the guilt is, people feel guilt. People feel guilt when they believe they're doing something wrong. Oh. So to which I'd say, what did you do wrong? You feel guilt if you committed a crime. You feel guilt if you stole something. You feel guilt if you cheated on someone. So when people, my clients tell me all the time, I feel guilty. I'm like, tell me what you did wrong. And that's when I get the pause. They're like, I don't want to go to Thanksgiving. I'm like, where's, I'm, I'm sorry. So help me understand where that's wrong. Well, that's what they want. I'm like, I hear that, but how is that wrong? Because the axiom to that is not doing what they want is wrong. Okay. Everybody, did you hear that? This is a huge takeaway. So if the lights are going off in your head and you're, and you're starting to go, wait a minute, I definitely either had a parent that had some narcissistic personality or I'm in a relationship with somebody like this. The reason why you feel guilty is because if you don't do what they say, that's wrong. Correct. That's exactly. You and think that's what you were trained to believe. You were trained to believe that is. And if you had a parent like that, let's say this is even happening in your, your committed relationship or your marriage, then that's another time when you were, you were almost indoctrinated into believing not doing what another person wants is wrong. And I, I like make the argument about it for me. This is foundational. Mm -hmm. Like, because what happens is the tantrum throwing. Yes. The shaming. Mm -hmm. The gas. Mm -hmm. I didn't say that. Like all the adolescent mm -hmm. tantrum Correct. behavior. Adolescent toddler. Yeah, is what actually has trained you mm -hmm. to believe mm -hmm. that not doing something that that person wants is wrong. That's why you feel guilty. That's why you feel guilty. Holy shit. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. How the hell do you get rid of that programming? Well, first of, first of all is one of the only paths forward to healing is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Right. That's I it. don't like that answer. And I know people don't like that answer. And I'll tell you why. Everyone goes to the damn gym and they lift the weights and they do the this and they're crossfitting that and, and they're in pain because they want a hot ass or they want abs or they want arms. And they want to look good. Why are you willing to tolerate pain there and you're not willing to tolerate pain here? Pain's pain, folks. Oh, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I thought I had learned everything there was to learn about narcissism from you, but I'm having major breakthroughs right now and insights. Uh, 
So should authentic or empathetic people, how do we protect ourselves from narcissists in life? It's a tough one. I, I think that it's every so often, Mel, every so often, and they're like that perfect seashell that's not cracked you find on the beach. I find these people who've actually never encountered narcissists. <clears throat> I find these people who have never encountered narcissism. They had two loving parents. They grew up in a happy home. They love all their siblings. They met someone in college. They fell in love. They both got good jobs. I hate these people. I'm no, just, just kidding. Yeah, I, well, I, <laughs> I, 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 I do. I, I wish this was I, everybody, I'm happy honestly. for them. I'm happy for them. And those people just like you talk about narcissism to them and I could be talking about like the, you know, like just some sort of like they think I have a tinfoil hat on. They really do. And I get it. I get it because they have absolutely no schema for that. But going back to the world of the authentic and the empathic, that's also especially the authentic folks. It's a rare group being off. Here's the thing about authenticity, Mel, and something we lose. And I think it really gets brought into stark relief when we're talking about narcissism. People talk about authenticity like it's an easy thing. The hardest thing in the world is to be authentic because to be authentic is to be unpopular. To be authentic is to blaze your own trail even when other people are cluck clucking at you and stigmatizing you and looking, giving you the side eye. What are you doing? Like people don't do that. You know, you're supposed to do the sort of missionary position, follow the rules kind of life. And authentic people say, no, that's not who I am. That's not what I'm about. Authentic people are very clear on their values, what they stand for, what matters for them. And so I'm not saying that authentic people don't feel guilt. They'll feel tremendous guilt, but they'll also feel committed to the potential within them and the people they care about. And to say, ultimately, giving in to this person's abuse is not doing, honestly, me any favors for sure. It's not doing my kids any favors. It's not doing the people I care about any favors. And it's actually not doing them any favors because it's reinforcing them in this sick cycle. And I don't want to be part of this. So we've got to get away from the idea that authenticity is easy. Authenticity, authentic people actually often have smaller social networks than other people because they, they've called away all the dead weight. They've cleared away all the branches that are, uh, that are dead. Like they, they said, no, I will not have people around me that are unhealthy, that are invalidating. I mean, it's, it's, it is a brave stand and it's not an easy, easy stand. And some people will say authentic people are selfish. They're cold. They're um, uppity. They'll, you know, that they'll, they'll really paint them in like, oh, who do you think you are that you get to do that? And all the authentic person is doing is trying to draw a boundary against unhealthy people. It is not easy to do because a lot of people feel like you got to go, you have, you have to put up with the unhealthy people. That's what we do. Families stick together and all that kind of stuff. And to which I say, no, I mean, why would we punish a person for, again, genetic bad luck for the rest of their lives? Mm. Is it normal for people to listen to you and start to worry Am I a narcissist? Because I'm also sitting here going, oh, my God. D like, have I, 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 do I, I, I kind of sound like this sometimes, like when I'm frustrated. Like, is this me? Like, now I'm starting to worry. Like, did this get like, ah, uh, is, is this my personality? So here's the thing. Not all of us, all of us, and sometimes even every day, have moments when we're not graceful. What we need to look at is how quickly and how authentically we make amends. So if you snap at someone at work, that you catch that and within, you know, very quickly say, uh, that was not okay. I am, I, I, I take responsibility for that. You, you know, you were not responsible for that. I was having a bad day, but that's not your problem. And so I apologize that we, when we, when we do those things now, no narcissistic person in the world is ever going to do that unless a publicist makes them <laughs> or, and then it, you can it, tell, and then you can tell do it. or, or, um, because they're trying to save face or they'll say my favorite, the, the narcissistic apology, which is, I'm sorry you feel that way. That's how narcissists apologize. I'm sorry you feel that way. Oh, my God. Oh, hell no. The minute I, say, I hear that, I'm like, this conversation's done. And I don't storm off. I usually, I'm very, you got to learn your sort of like nod, Mona Lisa smile and, and say, you know, I got to jump. Now, some people say that's passive aggressive. Well, there's no, there's no path forward. And if right. I'm not in the mood for a fight, you'll say, you know, okay, you know, I, I got to, I, I got to jump. Thanks again. Are we, and then close off the conversation on whatever else needs to get done. Am I more prone to dating a narcissist if I grew up in a household with a narcissistic caregiver? 
Well, it certainly sets you up with a vulnerability because it, it almost normalizes some of it. And it also takes away, it, it, it robs a person from their sense of self and the fact that they even have the right to express their needs. Well, that's a perfect trap because now if you're not expressing your needs, the narcissistic person you need isn't going to meet them anyhow. You can easily get caught, repeat that same trauma bonded dance of justifying this person's behavior, feeling that it's your fault. Like it really, it sort of indoctrinates you into accepting this behavior in a partner. Because it's familiar from childhood? It's familiar and it's also a... It, it becomes almost a psychologically a way of relating to the world. In fact, I've worked with more than a few survivors who said, you know, I met a healthy person. They were kind and empathic and generous of spirit and believed in me. And I convinced myself I was bored with them. Wow. That's so true. Mm -hmm. Like, it is true that mm -hmm. there are lots of, like, we all have a friend or a sibling. That you're like, they're such a nice person. Mm -hmm. All right, the, the person that you're supposed mm -hmm. to be with is right in front of you. And I tell them, if you've come from, come through a narcissistic family system and you meet someone, and I, boring's not even the right word, that you're not, I hate to say it, it's that you're not triggered by them, right? But you feel like it's not, it's not what you think love is supposed to be, which is exciting. But think about what your life was as a child. It was a roller coaster. Good days, bad days. I'm going to win them over. <gasps> Today's the day. Oh my gosh, who's going to come home today? <gasps> they have a candy bar in their briefcase for me. It's a good day. Like that kind of up and down and, and just anticipation almost makes it that an adult relationship that's characterized by that roller coaster revive is what you've conflated with love. So when a survivor tells me, I've met someone like, I don't know, it's not all the Zaza Zoo. I'm like, okay this might be a keeper let's just keep going sadly what i've witnessed mel is that many people had to go through the brutality of a narcissistic relationship and then after having to leave that and shut it down were they then able to hold space for someone who treated them with kindness and generosity it breaks their hearts they think what would my life have been if this was the kind of person i had been with all along but it's almost as though their psyche couldn't accommodate that because nobody's teaching this in school people well, learn about this after they've been hurt by it well and you know the thing that you just said that i think is really important is whatever that roller coaster was that was your experience of love because you were a child. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what you know. Mm -hmm. And so it makes a lot of sense to me. So for those folks that are listening, we got, a, we got this question a ton. What, well, first let me ask this. So if you listen to the first episode or you already know that you grew up in a household with a narcissistic parent, what are the few things that you need to do for your own healing so that you can be open to and interested mm -hmm. in somebody who's healthy, healthy for you. even though you've never mm -hmm. been with somebody who is number one is being willing to see it clearly this is a painful like it's that painful awareness of oh my gosh my parent is is if, if is, is narcissistic my parent is antagonistic i have a parent who has no empathy because it almost is like leaning into this sort of a lot of people say who had narcissistic parents said I felt a certain shame about my childhood. Like I knew something wasn't quite right here, but I didn't know what it was. No kid wants to be the odd kid out, right? Nobody wants to be the kid who has the fighting parents or something's not quite right in their home. And I think with people who grew up in those kinds of homes, it was sort of like fake, like to the world, like maybe your friends would come over and your parent would actually be really charming. But then when you're, everyone was out of the house, your parent was a rager. That kind of inconsistency really would leave people feeling like, what is wrong with me? Mm. So it becomes, it really becomes doing, th it is about therapy or doing the deep dive of, of being willing to sort of look at these patterns with a very open eye, no matter how painful it is, that just because you came from a narcissistic family system, it doesn't mean you're damaged. It's not an indictment of you, which unfortunately a lot of people feel. And then to really take a good hard look at where has this hijacked you? Where has this robbed you of your autonomy of your yeah. identity of who you are like do the hard work some of that can even be done if not just through therapy through journaling just being aware of where that happened how you talk to yourself how you apologize for things you didn't even do wrong how you're constantly putting yourself down self gaslighting yourself like oh i don't know what i'm talking about don't listen to me how many people do that reflexively that's a throwback to that childhood it's about getting your house in order 
before you start going out there and basically replicating those cycles. Mm. Unfortunately, that's not what people are taught to do. And a lot of people in their early 20s don't have the time, the volition, or the money to go into therapy. Yeah. Are there personality types that are more prone to like having a narcissist come into their lives? Well, I think that there's definitely the, um, the a person who's who comes from a narcissistic childhood. There's a vulnerability there. Listen, I'm going to say this, Mel, to make this almost as an easy question to answer. Everyone is. There's not a person out there who's not. And I'll tell you why. Because at first blush, narcissistic people are charming, charismatic, curious, confident, they're they, comforting even. They feel like they'll, they'll, they can take care of things. So if these people were coming in on date one, screaming at you and cursing at you, probably not going to be a date two. That, there's a whole phenomenon of love bombing. Well, okay, we'll get to love bombing in a minute, but how the hell are you supposed to spot one then if you're dating? You Because he, this is where the trauma bond becomes a problem. So what the trauma bond res, results in, not just that alternation between good and bad, but you justify the bad days. Right. So, oh, dad just had a bad day at work. I, I, um, mommy's just really tired. We're all pushing her to, and then you internalize that blame. Daddy had a bad day at work. I have to be good. You know, mom, mom's just really tired. I have to help. So like they're trying to, but they just, you justify, justify. Think of everyone in a narcissistic relationship. He had a tough childhood, has a competitive job. The deals haven't been coming through the way they want. They just want what's best for us. I mean, I, I mean, the, the, the justifications go on forever, but the justifications keep the toxic dynamic in place. And that's another core pillar of that trauma bond, right? So the justify, justify, justify. And so everyone's vulnerable. Because you meet someone and you're attracted to them and they are charming and interesting or whatever it is that appeals to you about them. And they stay that way four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, three months sometimes. Now you're in, you're falling in love with this person. Now the stuff starts to gurgle up, those those proverbial red flags. And what okay? are the proverbial red flags well, when you're dating? Okay, the red flags might be things like... Um, getting snappy when you give them a little bit of feedback, um, being really entitled when you go to a restaurant with them. So watch how they um, treat waiters. Watch how they treat waiters. Watch how they treat anyone, how they talk about other people, um, contemptuous dismissal. How how do they get along with your friends? Um, it may, may be that one of your friends, the one friend that might have called them out on someone, might be the one friend they say, you know, I don't, I don't think that friend's good for you kind of thing. So those things will pop up. But here's the thing. Mel, I was talking with someone recently on my own podcast. And in her situation, she didn't have a single six years of marriage, not one red flag. I'm going to make people listen to my podcast to hear what happened when that when the red flags came piling in. But there was someone six years. She's like, I am being honest with you. And people who knew me would say the same thing. There was no red flag flags so everyone I, i'm saying this for one reason why like I'll, why how, like a lot going. of people blame themselves they'll say that one day whether it's one year in two years in or 10 years in the narcissism shows up there must have been red flags i didn't see them i must be an idiot this is my fault this is my fault for not seeing the red flags and i really want to tell everyone while some of them may out be out there some of them may be humming at such a low level mm. that you're not noticing them or they're so reminiscent of what you grew up with they're like oh my god this is nothing compared to my right. mother kind of thing but in the vast majority of cases the red flags were there and it's a combination of they were they either people didn't know there were red flags people justified them or people blamed themselves immediately like i shouldn't have criticized their sweater you know even though it wasn't a criticism they quickly justify but Everyone is vulnerable. Now, are some people more vulnerable? Certainly. People who grew up with a narcissistic parent or parents, they're vulnerable. People with histories of trauma who already are sort of, might be sort of struggle. that can often result in self-devaluation and other phenomena that would lead a person less likely, you know, less likely to call out the red flags. People who, um, this is going to be a surprising one. People come from very happy families with two loving parents and just happy, happy. Those folks are vulnerable because they don't even, they can't even believe this exists. So when there's a red flag, they'll often think like, well, we just loved each other through this stuff. There ain't right. no loving anyone through a red flag. So they might turn to that. 
There are people who are going through uh, periods of transition. So like on the rebound, people will sometimes meet narcissistic people. When a person moves to a new city, has moved to a new job, has experienced a major loss. These are people who are already more vulnerable. And the idea that someone new is coming into your life, especially let's say new city. Oh, wow, this is great. I'm meeting someone. And you kind of go into the rom-com mindset rather than like, mm, this is moving a little bit quickly, that kind of thing. People who are in a rush are vulnerable. People mm. like, I got my biological clock is ticking, all my friends are getting married, that kind of thing. Those are folks who may be vulnerable saying, okay, I'm just going to have to settle here because I really want to be a parent and this is who's in front of me right now. And I can't tell you how many people have gotten roped in narcissistic relationships because they felt a time clock ticking around marriage, around settling down, around having a child. They, they really felt like it's, if I don't do this, I don't want to end up like my friend who en ended up never meeting anyone and regrets that. I'm, I'm, I tell you, one thing they regret probably don't regret that person. is exactly. And so all of these kinds of other sorts of vulnerability factors that a person can bring in can increase the vulnerability beyond what we all have. And I think that the idea that all of us, that, that somebody's not vulnerable, I mean, again, the unicorns out there are the people who really, really get, like almost see it right away. Listen, I do this. This is what I do. I'm still, I'm still, still played. People still come into my life. I'm getting better at it, but to get better at it, Mel, I almost had to become, I feel at times there's a part of me that's become kind of closed off. So is there one or two red flags that for you are just non-negotiable? Like the second you see that one, you are like, nope, because when you talk about being closed off, because you are extremely warm and extremely smart and extremely generous. And so I'm just wondering, because I think that what's scary about hearing all this is that by the time you kind of wake up and you're three months into something or three mm. years into mm. something mm. and all the bonds are there and the lease is signed and you're married or you have kids or now you've moved in together or now you're like mm -hmm. got all the chemicals flooding mm -hmm. your body because you're falling in love and you start to hear these red flags. You know, I never would have had the strength. I think when I Most think people like, don't. you know what I mean? To be like, Oh, okay. Nope. Time to end this. No, no, no. Most people don't. And that's again, it's important for people to hear that because a lot of people feel foolish. Why didn't I hear the red flags? I knew it on my wedding day. I knew it. I felt it. Because when we, you know, again, these stories are so easy to tell backwards, but at that point it would have felt cataclysmic. And in a way, this was the only way you were going to truly get the lesson. You know, it's, it's unfortunate. And I, you know, the, the issue then becomes like, when I meet somebody who's a little bit too charming, a little bit too charismatic, I shut down. Well, I'm like, why, what is this? And, and people are saying, you're, mm. you're the only person I've ever met who walks away from charismatic people, literally. I've been at gatherings and a person's just that person. And I'll, I'll, I, I, people must think I have some sort of bowel disorder. Cause I'm like, I have to run to the restroom. <laughs> the number of times at a social event, I'll say, I have to run to the restroom. People are like, what did she eat? You know, it's interesting that you say that because I recently had a couple things go down both in business and life that were just shocking betrayals, lies stolen from all that kind of stuff that just knocked me over. And when I look back through my life, there is a very pronounced pattern of me being drawn like a moth to the flame to very charismatic, hmm. funny, kind of rebel-y people. And I get sucked right in. And then I realize once I'm like kind of in the inner yeah. circle, oh my God, this person's unpredictable. This yeah. person like trashes people that mm -hmm, leave the room. Mm -hmm. This person mm -hmm. has major mood mm -hmm. swings. And then I literally go into a mode of just twisting myself in knots to not upset the person. Correct. That, that, and that is actually, that's actually a, a, a trauma response. Yeah. Like, twisting yourself into knots to not upset the person or even like you know like oh you're so great like the fawning response those are classic trauma responses and and it took 
a couple really painful experiences mm -hmm. back to back to have me look mm -hmm. backwards. Mm -hmm. It was almost like life hit me with a sledgehammer. Yeah, and that and I think that that's what it is too. You know, I, I you know I both worked in the media and you in a much more profound way than me. But I have to say, over the many years I've done this, what I've always seen was the charming, charismatic, grandiose people never ever ever followed through on their promises and and to much sometimes to almost to my fine to my very real financial harm and all of that and I thought and, and that happened in academia that happened in other areas of my life and so I think for me those those things have become correlated in my mind mm. big talker big promise big 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 all that big talk it never comes to fruition and I got hurt by this so when we talk about classical conditioning, it's like Pavlov's dogs, right? The salivating dog when they um, when they they heard the bell. For me, it's charm and charisma means you're you're about to you're about to either um, betray me, or or you're just full of BS. Hmm. And so that, but that a lot of harm had to come to me to learn that lesson. And when I connected the dots to my own childhood and my own experiences, I saw I could see how I got played. And like I said, now it it comes off as a a little bit closed off. I, I wouldn't be surprised if people would think that about me. And I do think that this is, though, in order for all of us to become more narcissist resistant, we need people around us that will back us up. And where I'm really blessed, at least professionally, is a team that calls BS. They'll read emails like, nah, no, no, yes, no, yes. And then I'll go deeper in. And sometimes I'll be like, yeah, sure. And they'll say, listen, it's, it's your gig. You call that one, but we don't love this. Right. And so it's, and that's, and did I hear that right? In fact, the other night I had had an experience that was really uncomfortable and it was, and I was like, was that uncomfortable? And I remember my team like that sucked. And I was like, oh, and I, and it was th so that you, if you have the people around you who are actually able to, to be authentic and, and call out BS, that's also another way you become more resistant to this nonsense versus it's almost like, like having siblings that bond together like healthy siblings yes healthy siblings. not siblings that throw you under the bus right and so and i think that because the problem is a lot of people are surrounded by enablers oh come on he kind of seems like a nice guy and he's cute and he's from the same place and he's your i'm like he's invalidating you i don't care how nobody's that cute uh-huh uh-huh. I'm sorry. As a mom now, I'm like, mm -hmm. uh, thinking about my daughters. But so what is love bombing? So love bombing is the, it's the, the sort of the, it's where the charm and charisma turn into behavior. It's the early phase of any narcissistic relationship. We tend to only use this term for romantic relationships. It can happen in friendships, workplace, you name it, anywhere. It is this intense and overwhelming I'm gonna call it a courtship where a person is it's almost an obsessive fascination with you they are is a person trying to win you over the classical kind of tropey love bombing is on your first date, you go to the best restaurant in town and then they get the concert tickets no one can get and on your third date, you fly to Paris and and you dance till 6 a.m. on the beach and, and it's so exciting and they make a scavenger hunt for you and they get you gifts and every Friday there's a dozen roses waiting for you. That's love bombing. It's fairy tale. It's larger than life. But it, 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 I think if we only use that trope, we, it's tricky. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's too who simple. can afford to do that? I'm like, that's well, a, they, like how, how do you do that on a blue collar budget? You can, yeah, I'll tell you how. Tell me how. You take people to whatever is considered the best restaurant in, you know, to your budget. Like yes. the person's still going to think that's great. They'll pack, they'll say, let's go on a drive to wherever the cool place to go on Got the it. drive is. I'm going to show you the coolest view you've ever seen in your life. They'll buy things. It might not it's be. It's like the whisk you off your feet. I'm proving to it's you. The, good night, princess good morning i can't start my day without thinking about you and then there'll be subtle things like take a picture where you're at i just want to see where you're at to me that's this person stalking you why do they need to know where you're at of course i am <laughs> the anti-romance do well, not well, do not find me on valentine's of those day is fine not like <laughs> I, but not on the like second date okay. right but it's a, a lot of that it's it's intense contact but love bombing just doesn't look like that love bombing may become really intense almost oversharing really early in the game like they're they're laying out like these this really deep, profound, true or untrue story about their past, about their childhood, about what they're feeling. And for some people, 
that's the play because they'll say, oh my gosh, this person's sharing so much. They're so vulnerable. And now you're kind of in because they've shared so much. Love bombing can be too much time together. Our first date lasted two weeks. Like, do you even have a job? Like what kind of, <laughs> I mean, what kind of first date lasts two weeks? So like when people say that stuff are like, I knew right away. I was like trauma bond, you know, like the minute people say that, I know that sounds so cold but it's actually not it's it is this sort of people might say like when i first saw them like i was really attracted to them but not like i knew right away but the two week first date there's this intense intention mm. they spend so much time together i canceled all my plans to be with them you know it was so their their lease came up and yeah we'd only been together a month but we decided to move in together fast 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 the fastness is also a part of love bombing it's an intensity mm. it's what i call an intense indoctrination into another person they are winning you over when you're being love bombed you're so distracted by the sharing by the obsession by the texting by the emails by the gifts by the quickness that you're not noticing the red flags so what do you do if you're a friend because i think oftentimes you know, if you see this happening to a friend or you as the friend on the outside start to have the red flags go up mm -hmm. and you say something to your friend, you know, maybe you guys should take it, take it a little mm -hmm. easier. Or, mm -hmm. you know, he, I, I hear he wasn't that great with his last girlfriend or like you just try Like, how do you approach it if you're the friend? Don't drop a dime on the other person because the minute you try what do you mean, to drop like, a dime, it's like, ah, I heard they weren't great with their other person. He's moving real fast. It, this is it's it's a it's a, something we learned from doing treatment with substance users is uh, do not make them defend their behavior and make don't make him defend the narcissist the minute you say he wasn't great with his his former partner yeah have you ever met his former partner and now they're defending them er, never do that you got to find the back door so how do you find the back you door with a loved like, one you say how how are you, talk talk to me about your new relationship how are you feeling how are you doing and, and they'll tell you the story wow, that's a lot happening. How do you feel about that? You might be more likely for them to say, yeah, you know, it is a lot. Like I'm trying to go with it because I've always thought like I don't deserve a fairy tale. Now I'm getting the fairy tale and say, what feels fairy tale-ish about that to you? You're trying to get them to talk without getting them to defend the mm. narcissistic person. Listen, I'm, I'm tr basically trying right now to train people to use therapy tricks here, right? right? But that's really what it is, because I think we're so quick to say, I don't like them. The first thing they're gonna do is defend them. You've got to get them to talk about the relationship so they start spilling on like, oh, I don't know about this. What do you mean you don't know about this? And let them talk and say, well, if you're feeling like that, do you think there's, you know, like, how, do you feel okay? Maybe, I don't know, like, take a step back. Like you, you can do that. Cause you, it sounds like this person cares about you so much. And I mean, that's, that's a little manipulative, but uh, if you're trying to save someone, yes. you try all, yes. you try all the tricks, but what you're trying to do is give them permission maybe to slow down, to pull back or like saying, ah, oh, he wants to move in right away and say, Hmm, you love having your own place. So how, how do you feel about that? Get them to talk about the thing that they value, which is the having their own place versus what kind of fool wants to move into your apartment in a month? Right, right. I got it. That's very, very clear. So if you're spotting this, just get them to talk. Open-ended questions. Do not say anything mm -hmm. that makes them defend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So interesting. I can look backwards now and see as a parent several mistakes that yeah. I made we, we, as, because as parents too, Mel, we're so quick in there to want to protect our kids. I think yeah. nowhere else do we see that reactive, like bad, bad, bad. And it's, it's, you know, it's almost like you can feel the clenching in yourself of saying, well, talk to me about this friendship and inside you're like, leave them. I hope you never talk to them again. Rah, rah, rah. You know, but you can't because everybody, when they're ambivalent about something and we raise the thing that they're ambivalent about as being bad, their, their, their reactive response is to defend that mm. thing because they're ambivalent. It makes a lot of sense. You know, it seems like you can't talk about narcissism, particularly in the dating world, without the term gaslighting coming mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what gaslighting is? Right. So gaslighting is a form of emotional abuse. It's a form of manipulation. But it's, it's a, it is a doubting of reality followed up with a, making someone feel impaired. And it, it, so it's not just lying, right? It's not like I didn't move the checkbook. That's a lie. Mm -hmm. Okay. They did move the checkbook. It's not that never happened. That's a lie. It did. 
All right. So that up to the first part of gaslighting is lying. It's the second part of it that makes it gaslighting, which is the, you say, we'll use a simple example. Did you move the checkbook? I always keep it in this drawer. Like I, no, I didn't move the checkbook. Are you sure you didn't move the checkbook? It's always in this drawer. You know what? Your memory has been going lately. This isn't the first time. And you know, you've been so distracted and stressed. In fact, it's affecting our relationship. Like, have you thought about talking to someone? Now it's become a conversation about how you have memory problems and are distracted and stressed out of your mind, but they actually did move the checkbook. You know, I had this situation, I can't really go into it in great detail, but dealing with a narcissist and a work relationship mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where I knew something was up, I would say, blah, 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 blah about the issue, and they would lie, mm -hmm. and then they would point it back, but you've been Correct. so busy. Correct. Mm -hmm. I handled it. Correct. Bingo. Over and over, and then yep. the more that the closer I got to the truth, the more I noticed this rage, yep. like this. Ugh. It's 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 in in the narcissist that I now see that I have dealt with, whether it's in work or in life or relationships or friendships. There's always this moment that I call that you know in the Bravo uh, New Jer Real Housewives of New Jersey that famous clip where that woman flips over yes. the table. Yes, yes, and I don't it's even like watch it. And I know rage. that. Rage. Yeah, it's rage. Yeah, it's a, that's a great narcissistic moment. So narcissist, yes. narcissistic rage is a thing. Oh, it's absolutely a thing. It okay. is a because it's a rage that's set off by their thin-skinned, uh, reactive sensitivity. Right. Something that does not require a table being flipped over. I don't know that anything anyone could say to you would be a table being flipped over. Right. I mean, short of like, I don't know. I I killed your best friend. I suppose I might flip a table over at that point. But short of that, no table flipping and table these very dramatic, dysregulated gestures. And afterwards, they'll soft pedal it or downplay it. Or give you a pseudo apology and then just do it again. Yeah. Wow. Are there other forms of gaslighting uh, that might surprise us? You know, like yeah, there's that sort of like lying and then flipping it back on you. Mm -hmm. But are there other forms of gaslighting that 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 surprise people? You know, in some ways, there's there's other things that are gaslighty, like a. Um, like the silent treatment in a way can have a gas gaslighty feel because you start feeling like you're losing your mind, you know? So that's a great example of sort of a, a, a gaslighty behavior. At some level, denial can have a gaslighty feel. I mean, again, gaslighting in its purest form is the denial of reality and then telling you you're, there's something wrong with you, right? So that's the sequence of it. But it is a... Um, but it can take these other kinds of, you know, these other sorts of, um, like, can't you take a joke is a great example of gaslighting. You're too sensitive. Yeah, you're too sensitive. You can't you take a joke is a great example of they insult you. All right. You have a reaction to that. Like, that was not okay. That, that was in front of a group of people. What were you thinking? I didn't mean it that I way. I didn't mean, I, I, can't you take a joke? So now you're this sort of hypersensitized, hyperreactive person who can't take something that was allegedly a joke, even though the tone or anything. Can't you take a joke? And again, I mean, I, I think comics do this all the time. I mean, I, I don't know, being a comedian relationship is probably a tough, because they're probably, everything's a joke, right? So, um, but it's a, uh, that, that's another great example, something you don't realize it's a gaslighting okay so now we are at the point of the podcast where i feel like we have popped the popcorn and everybody listening is going oh god and like <laughs> i'm spotting right. narcissists everywhere so let's start to talk about what do you do right. what do you do um and let's start with the example of how do you break up with a narcissist not every narcissistic relationship ends keep this in mind i think that should it Listen, if I ran the world, sure, but I don't run the world. And I also know that for some people, they're saying, you know what? I'm not going to divorce my parent. There's reasons of culture, reasons of other people in my family that matter to me, um, my own sense of duty and obligation and responsibility. I see them clearly now, though, and I'm going to interact with them differently, but I'm not going to end all contact with them. Okay. okay? There are many people, I'd say 50% of people in narcissistic marriages stay in long term committed relationships, stay. And I understand that. And I don't think that there, there should be a pressure to go because when there's that pressure to go, 
what I see is a lost opportunity to help that person heal and grow even while they stay in it. So by the person heal and grow, you're talking about the person who's in the relationship yes. because mm -hmm. as we learned in the mm -hmm. very beginning, you can't change the weather cannot. in Chicago and you cannot change. Well, we're not changing the narcissist. That's you, not even on the table. Well, and, and, and it's important for everybody to hear this because you are listening to the world's leading expert on this who has had a clinical practice, who has been an academic, who is sought after by everybody on this topic. You have been in clinical settings treating narcissists who have come in looking for help mm -hmm. because it now serves them because the board of directors is now getting mm -hmm. ready to fire them or their their spouse is ready to divorce them or they genuinely feel that everyone's out to get them they're they're i mean remember narcissistic people are very victimized if things aren't going their way everyone's out to get me i have a target on my back witch hunt witch hunt that kind of thing how come everyone's out to get me how come life's so unfair to me Yep. Yep. And if you are in a clinical setting and you are working with a narcissist who is self-motivated to try to change, mm -hmm. how much can they change? It's a great question. So I've, I've worked with many clients like this. You're going to get the best we can hope for is a little bit more accountability They'll still have rage, but they might catch it and apologize a little bit more. They are still going to roll their eyes when they don't want to listen to someone, but they'll maybe do it less. Um, they'll huff and puff when they're made to wait in the line at the airport, but they won't scream at the gate agent. Um, you get you, they, they can sprint through some stuff. You can get them to sprint through some stuff, but they're never going to be marathoners. They're still going to drop the ball a lot. I've worked with people who once they learned what it meant to stop being this way, which meant empathy, listening to people, being present, holding space for them, being accountable for their bad behavior, um, uh, not getting angry at people or sharing their feelings. I had one person say to me, this is what this is about. And I said, um, yeah, so... <laughs> He said, I want to break in therapy for a little while. And in that period of time, he divorced his wife and broke up with his mistress. And I said, oh, and he's like, you know what? And this is, he said, I don't want to hurt these people. I really don't want to hurt people, but I can see they're getting hurt. And you've clearly pointed that out in here that I am hurting them. Because I would say that that's, I mean, how do you think they felt? We did a lot of what's called mentalization work, forcing the person to think about how do you think that other person feels? And in a therapy room, if they scream at me, I'd be like, bye out you're not my client anymore so they um they he said I don't want to hurt them but I don't want to listen to them I'm not interested in their bs I'm not interested in their feelings like I could do it for 10 minutes but this hours thing no I want to live in my own place and I miss sex so I found someone and I pay her every two weeks and she comes by and I don't want her to wake up next to me and sounds like a real peach okay but was I you know what I'd say kind of a peach I wasn't mad at him. He, his ex-wife can now go and find, is no longer chased. She may still wonder so why what is I not enough. So what do you do if you're the ex-wife? Because I think one of the other things that I've learned from you is that the damage that a narcissist yeah. does. She's got to go do her work now. I mean, And she's what gonna, is that yeah. work? That work is learning about narcissism, understanding you're not to blame. It's almost like, a person is going to be less frustrated by their car breaking down if they know how their car works. Right? So now you're yep. like, oh, this mechanic's taking advantage of me. I'm like, nah, now you know how to change your own carburetor. Like, I'm teaching you how to, to, to fix this thing. Got okay? It. And the fix is not in them. It's in you. Because remember, you ain't changing the weather in you're Chicago. You're not changing weather in Chicago. And, and, and I, ultimately, the person that you treated that would do these very intense mm -hmm. visualization exercises to try to understand empathy. The only thing that happened is that he gained the knowledge to go, I'm not doing that. And here's the thing though, that to me is a form of empathy because I'll tell you this, instead of saying, well, she needs to step up. She needs to meet me where I'm at. Mm -hmm. He's like, I don't want to hurt these people. And I am going to keep hurting them because if you think I'm going to sit here and listen to their BS feelings without rolling my eyes, you're high. So Dr. Romani, you have really helped me because there were kind of some major takeaways that I've learned from you. 
One being that you don't change the weather in Chicago, you're not changing the behavior of a narcissist or the brain of one, period. Second, that narcissists are made during childhood. They're not necessarily born that way. They're not. They're definitely not born that way. The third thing is that if it's truly somebody with a narcissistic personality, they don't even know they're doing it. It's not like it is a conscious behavior. No. It is so ingrained in, in how they behave that it's a, like a reaction to situations. Correct. But this takes, this is an important flip I need to make on that. Because people say, well, if they don't know, then I can't be mad at them. To which I say, yes, you can. We recently had a YouTube video. I think it's come out or it's coming out soon. Basically, is that multiple things can be true. Mm -hmm. And nowhere is that more true than in a narcissistic relationship. This person had a tough childhood. Yup. This person invalidates me every day. Yup. We have kids together. Yup. They're not going to stop doing this. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Like, yes, all those things can be true at the same time. What is the most important truth for somebody that is listening right now who realizes, oh my God, I'm in a relationship with a narcissist. What is the most important truth that you want that person to start to think about and embrace? This is not your fault. You're not responsible for somebody else's behavior. You're not. You're not even At some level, maybe we could say that about our children's behavior to a point, but even there's a point that that goes away, right? You are not responsible for, the, well, they're reacting to me. No, they're reacting. And there's other ways to react. So they could, they could calmly say to you, I, I don't like how you're talking to me and I need a minute. Can teach them those things. They can go to therapy and learn that, but they feel entitled to their reactions. Mm. They feel entitled to their rage. This is how I react. I, this is who I am. And that's the other thing you'll hear. Um, authentically, this is who I am. To which I want people to say, then maybe that doesn't work for you. And listen, Mel, there's many a person out there who waits till their youngest child turns 18 and that's the day they file for divorce. Yep. Wow. You know, the other thing that I learned from you today that was just a game changer was when you said you are trained to believe that doing something that a narcissist doesn't like is wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. That's where the guilt mm -hmm. from That's where comes the guilt from. Comes from. Yep. That you learned guilt because somebody made you believe that it's wrong to disappoint them. Correct. Correct. And, and because you learn that, you learn that as a child. That is one of those things that gets indoctrinated in childhood. And then you carry that into any relationship where there feels like there's a power difference or somebody is more dominant. And that's why people like this will repeat these cycles at work, repeat them in intimate relationships. And even what do you in do if your boss is narcissist? Oh, like they're constantly raging at you. They're, you know, they're, they're unpredictable. They take credit for everything. How do you handle that situation? Here's the thing. Workplace situations are interesting because, you know, it's, I understand people need jobs and sometimes people say, I am never going to find a job that pays me this much. Like I'm making, and I, I'm my primary, primary bread, breadwinner in my situation. Then we go back to that radical acceptance. You are in a job where you're going to be raged at. In the workplace, I say to people, you got to document the hell out of this. You got to make sure you don't take meetings alone. You save every email, you save every voicemail, you save every text message. Because if you ever need to engage in any kind of HR or litigation, you're going to need that. It's impossible to push on workplace issues without that. And even then, bullying, workplace bullying isn't against the law. It's not. And so it's really, really hard to do that much with it. Um, when you say radical acceptance, what exactly does that mean? So you're in a situation, because I saw this in, early in my career. I was a lawyer. I was a public defender first. And then when we moved to Boston, I worked in a large law firm. Mm -hmm. And the amount of yelling that mm -hmm. came out of partners' imagine. offices yep. and the shaming and the like, just demeaning mm -hmm. way that people were spoken mm -hmm. to and yelled at during the hallway, and it was tolerated. Because that dude brought a lot of That's money exactly, into the firm. It's, it's what I call the golden goose phenomenon. And it's why in a workplace, if you recognize the golden goose phenomenon as a play, meaning that there's no way the people higher up in the leadership are going to remove this rager because they're bringing in too much money. Nobody kills the golden goose. Yep. Then you have to ask yourself, where do I fit into this? I mean, in most cases, Mel, I had to say that the only, the only good ending to it, either if you're lucky, and this is luck, 
when that narcissistic manager, boss, or person is removed, usually because institutional organizational settings kind of stink from the head down. Like there's a culture that right, was, right, that was sort of fostered. It. Same that, in the family. Yeah, it's very unlikely that that will happen. But sometimes people get lucky in their one division that happens. But if that doesn't happen, most people need to ultimately leave. Yes. And for, it can be a huge career change. People will say, I'm out. I cannot work like this. Some people might modify what they do. They'll say, you know what? I am going to not make, I'm going to take a huge financial risk and I'm going to put out my legal shingle and I'm going right. to open a small I'm sorry. practice. There's way too many companies and jobs out there yeah. to tolerate mm -hmm. that bullshit. I agree. Period. I agree. And it's taken years off. But they, it's a, in fact, workplace this kind of workplace antagonism is a unique kind of stress that has actually been found to be quite associated with physical health problems. And I think a lot of that is because for some reason, workplace narcissistic abuse keeps people up at night. And I think it's because you come home, you're exhausted, and then you wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, I can't, what am I, you know? I'm going to get in trouble gonna, tomorrow. Ruminate, 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 ruminate. And that goes on day after day after day. I mean, these are bosses who have no problem calling, you know, interrupting a person on their vacation saying get in here now and and um you're having to clean up their mistakes like you said they take credit for your work they gaslight um these are environments of fear it's it's very triangulated where some people trying to get on the good side of the narcissistic person i mean it's chaos it's chaos and i have never seen anyone successfully pull it off you'll even see in some of the higher profile me too narcissism scandals we've seen people are like i just want to work on one film that gets an oscar and that's going to help my career but you know what you have to live with the moral injury for the rest of your life that you were part of that machine and you're not going to change the weather in Chicago you're not going to change the weather in Chicago and you're also going to have to live with this blood on your hands which is an act a different level that people in workplace settings will sometimes say this is what I worked in and what does that make me so I want to uh end with some tools that people can use. Mm -hmm. So one of the ones that you talk about that, um, whenever I share it, I obviously credit you that people just love this and that's gray rock. Yeah. So gray rocking and that, you know, I can't even take credit from that. Gray rocking is something that's been around for a long time. And gray rocking is gray rocking is a response to the constant baiting that happens in a narcissistic relationship. Narcissistic people love to fight because it makes you look crazy, right? If you're getting frothed up, ah, now you're raging kind of like them and they're like, oh, you need to calm down. That's a form of gaslighting too. They get you worked up and then they look at you like you're the one who's unhinged. So the way in some ways to bring down that baiting is just completely disengage in the most absolute, but you're, you're not going no contact, but you're saying, yes, no, okay, I didn't know that, sure. Now, now let me ask you a question mm -hmm. about this. Because in our family, somebody has had a situation where there was an ex blowing up their phone and Snapchat. Rage, 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 rage. Which once I learned that this was happening, um, a lot of other young women chimed in. Oh, well, I've had somebody do that. And, you know, it's been dismissed because they're mm -hmm. drunk or because they're this or because yep, they're yep. upset or because I'm the ex mm -hmm. or because I'm dating somebody new. And, you know, we're talking 75 texts over the course mm -hmm. of one evening. Pick up your phone. Why aren't you? I know you're ignoring it's abuse. me. That's abuse. So when it comes to that, do you, you don't respond at all because aren't they looking for the response? Yes. Yeah. Aren't they seeking the attention? Right. Now you can see in a situation like this with gray rocking, like you, you're like, okay, I'm not responding to this kind of stuff. The behavior is going to escalate for a while and that escalation scares people. So the gray and gray rocking is, it's, if you're going to gray rock as an, as an, pathway to an exit to what's ultimately called no contact, which is a really, really stringent characteristic that a lot of people can't follow because yes. they're families they're, they they have to co-parent all those things it, you know whatever it may be N full no contact is is when people do it they're like this is great like i never have to have anything to do with them again but it's not always possible so the gray rocking will initially enrage the narcissistic person if you can white knuckle it for long enough how long it and depends this on the a, person this is an excellent Excellent example for those of you yep. that are in, in a contentious divorce, yep. Yep. for those of you that are dealing with child custody issues, and so you have to negotiate after correct. divorce drop-offs so, or exes, and so pay attention to this because you are correct. If you ignore them, they explode because they want your attention, Right. and so now they're going to escalate it to try to get it. 
so now here's this is where a, a, a friend and colleague of mine developed something called Yellow Rock. Tina Swithin, who um, does amazing work in, in the space of contentious narcissistic divorce, she came up with Yellow Rock. And the idea of Yellow Rock is not so much the yes, no, like you're almost like so dull, but it's like, yeah, sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. There's emotion. There's lilt. There might even be like, oh, you went there? Oh, d did you like that? Oh, oh that, that's that new grocery store, right? You're not talking about anything. But yellow rock isn't so dire. Now, in your obsessive texting example, that's a different kind of a situation because that's a case where you just don't respond, Correct. right? And you save it all. And if it continues like that, you actually might even need to involve well, law enforcement. We involved that. Uh, Chris, my husband, yeah. he sent mm -hmm. a text back mm -hmm. saying, we'll involve mm -hmm. law enforcement. Yeah, exactly. Knock it off. So it, it's, it worked. Yeah, it works. It, in many cases, but in some cases it does not. And there's actually a threshold of the number of communications that have to happen for it to qualify to get law enforcement involved. You know, so they it, it can't be 10 or 20. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a vast number. They're like, oh, so for me to be fully traumatized is the only reason <laughs> only way law enforcement will respond and it's true those bars are set in a way that it's, it's, it's hard to intervene but in ordinary situations where it is a lot of the they're trying where were you on saturday night what were you doing oh your friend coming over and say oh yeah everything's fine like you're it's, it's very stepfordy like da -da 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 -da. but if for kids to see gray rocking parents actually is quite traumatizing that that devoid of emotion robotic feel is unsettling for kids it can be unsettling in the workplace so with yellow rocking i always say to people have a list of in inert innocuous topics to talk about the weather the freeway is going to be closed on friday it's um you know, it's, uh, can you believe it's only a month till this holiday? Like you, you have those topics in your back pocket and then there can be a lot of that. And once they start baiting, then the next technique I recommend people use after gray or yellow rocking is I tell them, don't go deep and don't go deep means don't defend, don't engage, don't explain, don't personalize. Oh, that was an acronym, everybody. Yeah, deep. Don't defend. Don't, don't explain. Don't, don't engage. Engage. Don't personalize. What does don't personalize mean? So can you give us an example so, of how I, this works? So, don't, so a person's coming at you with like, oh, great, great. Yeah, I can see. Oh, what is this? One of your loser friends having one of their stupid fundraisings for one more of their causes? Like, uh, yeah, your friend's like an idiot loser. So sure. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, let's, let's give, let's give this person more money. You know, I don't even know why you're friends with these people. Like, is that how pathetic? So you're blah, 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 the noise, they come at you trying to isolate you, right? You don't defend your friends. You don't say, oh, she means so well. She's raised so much money for this community. You don't explain what the charity does. You don't engage in the back and forth. And you don't make it about you. This has nothing to do with you. That has to do with their, their insecurity. Their temper tantrum. Their, their tantrum, their insecurity, their being set off. And you, and you, you, oh, this is where it's, this is a hard one. People say, I told Mary I was going, I RSVP'd, I'm going to be going. Do you say I'm sorry? No, why would you, what did you do wrong? I because I'm conditioned to, <laughs> yes, I don't know. I just want to keep you I'm happy. sorry. I don't know. <laughs> I, if I, girl, if I could set up an app that could identify. I think you to shock me. <laughs> Oh, oh my that, lord! It, that every time a person says "I'm sorry," they did get like a little shock through their watch, or that is like the a worst ring. thing you could say to a narcissist. It, I'm sorry, well, but no, it's the worst thing you could say for yourself. Why are you apologizing? We're back to the guilt because I have been conditioned to believe correct. that if I do something that makes you mad or disappointed or isn't what you want, that I'm bad. You, that's that's you. That's a you thing. That's your work because oh my I'm God. going I to Mary's so fundraiser. I'm going to Mary's Dr. fundraiser. Romney. Why should I say I'm sorry? I RSVP'd four weeks ago. I am not getting into Mary's character assassination because you feel threatened. I'm none of that. You're just, I RSVP'd a month ago. I'm planning on going. I'll be leaving at seven. Done. You can do it with a smile on your I'll face. I'll tell you, I just sit here and think, why on earth would you put up with that in your life? Maybe the, I'm the good days. You know what I mean? Nope, Maybe nope, I'm Mel, combative. And Mel, I'm like, listen, asshole, I make my own money and I'm going to give it to whoever mm -hmm. the fuck I want. It's the good days and the bad days because you actually had a really nice dinner out on Saturday night. 
and he, and they had a bad day today and they're stressed uh-huh. out and they had a lot of childhood trauma. And, and oh relationships are hard and everything's compromised and oh. they don't really mean it and blah, 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 blah. So if you could break up... Get into the multiple truths, break out oh, of the yeah, cognitive there's multiple dissonance truths. and say, You're like, right. I, I, can't be I judgy. I'm sorry. am married to a person who's, who's an d- asshole. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say deeply <laughs> insecure and reactive, which is code for ass. <laughs> See, asshole is the one tidy word that gets at that. But I am married to a deeply insecure person who is a rager. That is who I'm married to. It that is, is a Trump truth. And say that sentence out loud. It, 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 it all relates to a concept called cognitive dissonance. We don't like it when incompatible things are happening. That's true. So we to break the tension, we justify. That's true. So it's like the truth, the, the, the things that are true are I am married to somebody who's who an is asshole. an insecure jerk, right? Yep. Because of childhood drama, whatever, and, and, and rages. I also have children with this person. Mm-hmm. I also don't want to go through the nightmare of divorcing mm-hmm. this person. I'm mm-hmm. going to work on my own stuff right. in order to have that cognitive psychological mm-hmm. dissonance mm-hmm. To, in order to figure out my own stuff. But you can see after you do all that, you know how people feel? They feel sad. They're like, this is my life. Yes. Because once you actually wake up and do yes, the work, oh, and boom, that's you it. just did yeah, a Trojan it. horse. We want you to go to therapy. So you become more confident <laughs> and more self-aware that you actually do not deserve this Correct. this is not your fault the weather yeah. in chicago weather is in something chicago. you can't change oh sneaky i like that yeah, it's all i about, like that kind of personal empowerment. all about therapy is always about finding those back doors and you can't walk in the front door that's no. a, we learned that in day one of therapy class. yeah that's amazing wow you are so smart mm, you are so, so sure smart so one takeaway or like a cut what takeaways do you want uh, people to like really talking to somebody who just had a wake up call. Cause we also learned that if you truly are somebody that has a narcissistic personality, you're thinking that none of this applies to you. You're but right. if you're uh, listening and you're starting to think of people in your life, whether it's at work or friendships or siblings or the person that you're in a relationship with or parents or grandparents, what are some of the key takeaways that you hope people have gained um, from this doctor, you're not to blame for someone else's personality. You can't change them. Um, you, you have the right to your independent, autonomous life, separate from other people, opinions, feelings, needs. Um, and above all else, I want to let people know that there are many people out there who hear this and say, well, I got to go. I got to leave this relationship. And some people do. They, they end contact or really suspend contact with a family member or even a parent. They, um, they may end a romantic relationship. They may start doubting their own marriage. They may even consider quitting a job or whatever. But then they, they start saying, but I want to go back, but I miss the person, but I'm having second thoughts, but we're getting back together, but I showed up at the family wedding anyhow. And what I tell people is this isn't about an all or nothing, and you will be pulled back because there's no talking your way out of a trauma bond. A trauma bond is something you feel. Some people will say, the idea of no longer talking to my mom or no longer being this marriage, I feel sick. Mm-hmm. Like, I can't do this. I feel, literally feel sick inside mm-hmm. inside of me. So that's a real physical feeling. And it's understanding that these incompatibilities leave us feeling uncomfortable. We do get pulled back in. We, the, it's for me to keep saying to people, this is not, this, this is not going to change and it is not your fault and it is all internal to them. And this is what the apparatus looks like. That even on those days when you feel sad, because there's, this is a landscape characterized by grief. There's so, this was my childhood. I never got to have a real childhood. I didn't ever let my dreams launch. I got into a crappy marriage. I may never have a normal adult relationship. I screwed up my kids. This is real grief. There's no soft pedaling. You don't get a do over on this Mm. stuff. And so for people, some of these negative emotions do echo through a lifetime. Mm. And it's not, I'm, I wish I could sit here and say something fluffy like, and one day you'll never think about this again. What I want to tell people is that one, you're going to learn to coexist with that pain and you're slowly going to find your voice. And it's almost like if you had a really bad accident or injury, every, even if you could fully do your physical therapy and heal, every so often you're going to step on that leg the wrong way. You're going to be like, 
ouch. And you're reminded. And it is a, it doesn't all just go away. You start learning the workarounds and you understand that there's going to be good days and bad days. Because I think setting an overly sunny kind of a path forward for healing can lead people who feel like they're not healing fast enough, feeling ashamed and as though they can't even heal right. There is no healing, right? This will take as long as it takes. There will be good days and bad. But if you're willing to give yourself permission to take yourself and reality back, there actually is a path forward. And survivors of narcissistic abuse often go on to do amazing things. They they write amazing things. They cre- they, 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 they There's a creativity and it's almost like a WTF of it all. Like, all right, you know, at this point, why not? Like I survived this mess, why not? And they'll do some really cool, fun, they'll blog, they'll, they'll self-publish books, they'll start businesses. Um, they'll go back to school. I remember one woman I worked with, she's like, eh, I went back to school. I was 75 when I graduated, but I finally finished college after being told I was an, a moron, a fool, an ass for 50 years. And she's like, I'm not going to work, but I, I did it. And the pride that was felt, the survivor stories are remarkable. They're small. They're big. It's the person, who, my favorite was the person who said she, she, her, she was an, ama- she's an amazing cook and her malignant narcissistic marriage for many, many years. She baked his favorite cake and she um, gave it to uh, people who were um, homeless in her neighborhood. And she's like, eat this because I'm never eating this kind of cake. And they loved it. And so, you know, some people actually said, I actually cooked their favorite meal and threw it out. Some people don't like to throw out food. I get that. Um, Some people had a big blowout party on the night of what would have been their malignant narcissistic ex's birthday party and said, I got to put this behind me. the, The... this can take so many forms. Some people go back to school and become therapists. Some people become coaches. They well, help you know people through it. What I love about it. this, Dr. Romani, is that like, n- when you understand something mm-hmm. and there is this intense fascination with narcissism, and so many of us mm-hmm. have experiences uh, with it, but when you understand it and when you have a few simple tools mm-hmm. from an expert like you, it does become an opportunity for growth. Mm-hmm, it becomes an mm-hmm, opportunity mm-hmm, for self-awareness, mm-hmm. for self-compassion, that just because the weather in Chicago can't be changed and you can't change what that other person is mm-hmm. doing, that multiple things can be true. Yeah. But the thing that we know is always true is that if you're willing to put in the work, you can make the situation that you're in better for yourself. Yes. Because you can change the way that you show up. You can change the boundaries that you have. You can change the way that you internalize things or not. Yeah. And people who are going through these relationships are sometimes thinking, I almost don't want to be happy because it's such a contrast to what I'm in in this relationship. So it's almost, it's a sense of, okay, maybe I'll just going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to take care of me because me not taking care of me fits. It's again, that making it all fit. I say, find those ways because they're, I call them these tiny acts of rebellion. The way you squeeze in, because if you exercise and they know about it, like, oh, why are you wasting time? You must have a lot of leisure time if you can exercise. But then you realize like, oh, I have 18 minutes before they get home and you jump on the treadmill or you throw on the yoga um, channel on your whatever YouTube you watch and you, you do it. Like you find these tiny acts of, of rebellion that you could do you every day you have a goal and each day for 365 days you do one thing towards the goal and maybe you finish that degree online and here's the win never ever tell the narcissistic person your dreams never ever tell them your aspirations because they will mock you and they will dismantle you and they will even try to get in the way of them the rebellion is to go and pursue those dreams without them ever knowing and once you've done it You've done it. You don't even have to share it. And what's really fun to watch is when the narcissist hears from someone else like, wow, did you hear about that whole thing they set up? And the person like, why didn't you tell me? And you're like, ah, it didn't seem like that big a deal. And mm, you just get it in there, but never share your dreams with them. Wow. I'm thinking about this moment in a speech where I was in the audience and um, it was a women's conference and this woman stood up and she was talking about how she had this massive dream of getting this degree online. And that her husband wouldn't allow it. No. And I remember thinking how sad it was to realize that she was trapped in this life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the thing that I want to say is that 
these tiny acts of rebellion, if you feel like you're trapped in this and there's multiple things that are true, these tiny 18 minute moments of rebellion are almost like digging a tunnel. They are. That allow you over time to escape mm -hmm. because every time you do something that is for you first yes. and you don't feel the need mm -hmm. to share it or get permission and you keep showing up every day and you do that exercise or you do that meditation or you take that mm -hmm. online class and you don't seek the permission or validation from that narcissist, if you start to exercise that muscle, mm -hmm. at some point you're going to wake up yes. and you're going to realize, oh my God. I'm actually above ground and outside the yep. jail. Why did I, I stay in? Yep. Okay, I'm not going to validate yep. myself, but I'm ready to make a big change now. Uh, you you start to see I can do stuff. You you by doing the, those tiny acts of rebellion, there's something in you that gets awoke, and you're like, I can do stuff, and maybe I am strong enough to do this or to do that. You meet other people. You get validated in different ways. You get the A on the paper, and the professor says, "Wow, like why aren't you going to graduate school after all those years of being invalidated?" To have someone say. There's something special about you. Just that one conversation can change the course of somebody's life. But that's only going to happen when you do all these tiny acts of rebellion. And that might be one of the most important steps to survivorship. This isn't about like storming out and like, oh, I'm leaving you. But you can do all these little things because I know leaving can feel overwhelming for mm -hmm. people. And whatever that might be, it might be reading an entire set of literature, it might be learning another language. You can do that on your own time, too. But whatever it looks like. That somehow getting that new skill, actualizing that dream and not letting them know about it or harm it, can it, it can awaken something in you, the real you, that may actually allow you to start really distancing from this relationship, if not physically, definitely psychologically. You know, I just also like felt really empowered because I realized that's also something that we can do as friends and sisters and mm -hmm. siblings and seeing other people that are in these situations, Correct. validating somebody, you know, not being, not doing the thing that I probably would have done in the past, which is why don't you leave him? Like, why mm -hmm. don't you cut him off? Like mm -hmm. just validating the small moves of independence and rebellion mm -hmm. that somebody's making and being an, uh, being somebody who is an ally in that mm -hmm. is a way that you can support someone. Another way you can do that, is you can listen uh, to, to this podcast. You can share this podcast. Uh, you can listen to Navigating Narcissism. Yes, Follow can. that podcast. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.